Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast. Celebrating pro and college football history. This episode, the 1948 NFL Championship Game. With guest Upton Bell. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast. I'm your host, Jackson Michael, and this is the first of a three part series with Upton Bell, son of the great NFL commissioner Burt Bell, who also founded the Philadelphia Eagles. Upton also has a book out called Present at the Creation, My Life in the NFL and the Rise of America's Game. Both his book and The Game Before the Money were published by the University of Nebraska Press and are available on Amazon.com. Upton is going to share stories that no one else can. He has closely watched the NFL since the 1940s when his father was commissioner. So he grew up a huge fan of the NFL. Then he worked for the Colts all through the 1960s. So Upton is literally a walking, talking NFL history time machine. He recently mentioned to me that these three games that we'll look at, the 1948 NFL championship game, the 1958 NFL championship game, and Super Bowl three are what he calls the holy trinity of NFL games. And in this three-part series, we're going to look at those three games that changed the NFL forever. And it marked the NFL's growth from a league that might not even make it to the kingpin of sports leagues in the United States. And what's extra interesting about this is those three games each happened 10 years apart. The 1948 NFL Championship game was the first televised NFL Championship game. This is super important to know in terms of league history. And 10 years after that game, there was what's always remembered as the greatest game ever played. The 1958 NFL Championship between the Colts and the Giants. And 10 years after that was Super Bowl three, the Jets big win over the Colts to determine the 1968 world's champion. That was a trend-setting Super Bowl and a hallmark game in NFL history, and not just because the Jets won. And we'll get into that game in part three of this series. Upton Bell was at all three of these games in person, and he will provide some truly inside historical insight throughout this series. In this episode, We're going to look at the 1948 NFL championship game between the Chicago Cardinals, now known as the Arizona Cardinals, and the Philadelphia Eagles, the team Upton's father, Burt Bell, founded. And you can hear more about that story from Upton in both his book and the Burt Bell episode of the Game Before the Money podcast. By 1948, Burt Bell was the NFL commissioner and was no longer a team owner. At that time, the NFL wasn't even close to being the number one sports league in America. Sports fans followed baseball and college football much more than pro football. Furthermore, even the NFL's position as being the top pro league was challenged by the AAFC, the All-American Football Conference. It's also key to know that radio was king at the time. It was the main source of news and entertainment in America. Television wasn't nearly as popular or as affordable as radio in the late 1940s, but those in the know recognized the possibilities. In 1948, there were tens of thousands of televisions in the United States compared to tens of millions of radios. Still, President Harry Truman, in 1948, delivered the first State of the Union address on television. 
political party conventions were televised for the first time. And NFL commissioner Burt Bell also jumped on board and signed a contract to have the 1948 NFL championship game televised. Take a listen. I can't spend it any more time. On a specified... Lieutenant. <laughs> Burt Bell understood that television was the future of American entertainment. And the quicker he got his league entrenched into television, the better the chance that his NFL could substantially increase its fan base. In today's world, it's kind of like recognizing the internet's potential for sales and jumping on it as quickly as possible like eBay or Amazon did. Burt Bell saw his league's future tied to television. And you know what? Television helped turn pro football into the most popular sport in America, and specifically the NFL as the most popular sports league. Because by 1950, just two years after the 1948 NFL championship game, there would be millions of television sets in America. And by 1950, the AAFC would partially merge with the NFL. And by the mid-1950s, Burt Bell had Americans starting to watch NFL games as a weekly habit. So by 1958, millions of people tuned in to the NFL championship game, and that game cemented the NFL into the American culture. The road to the NFL's immense popularity through television was not always easy. And in fact, it was nearly snowed out. Which brings us back to this episode's focus, the 1948 NFL championship game. What makes this game so important? Well, obviously it was the first televised NFL championship game. That alone gives it a special place in NFL history. But the game also set a tone for how the league would be run. It taught television networks that the NFL was dependable, and it also provided viewers with a memorable experience they couldn't get through the radio, an experience we now take for granted as football fans. But at the time, televised football was a novel idea, especially live broadcasts. Also important to know about the 1948 NFL championship game is that it was a rematch of the two teams that played in the 1947 NFL championship game, the Philadelphia Eagles and Chicago Cardinals. That 47 game was an exciting game that was decided in the fourth quarter. This is Al Rosenberg reporting from Comiskey Park in Chicago, Illinois, and the 1947 NFL championship game has just completed, and the Chicago Cardinals are champions of the world. After a 28-21 victory over the visiting Philadelphia Eagles, Charlie Cooper had two touchdowns, including a 75-yard punt return, and Chicago's Elmer Ainsford also scored two touchdowns, and Chicago's million-dollar backfield overwhelmed the Eagles with big plays. Philadelphia quarterback Tommy Thompson set a championship game record with 297 yards passing. But it was the Chicago Cardinals who claimed the title today. The next season, in 1948, the Eagles wrapped up the East Division title and a spot in the NFL championship game fairly early. The West Division title, however, and the second spot in the NFL championship game came down to the last week of the season between crosstown rivals. The Chicago Bears and Chicago Cardinals each sported 10-1 and records and duked it out in the season's final game of a 12-game regular season. The Cardinals led by their million-dollar backfield, defeated the Bears to advance to the 1948 NFL Championship game at Philadelphia. The Cardinals were favored to win based on their 11-1 record and the fact 
that they had beaten the Eagles in the previous year's championship. Furthermore, they had won their last five games against the Philadelphia Eagles. NFL legend Johnny Blood, however, made headlines by predicting that the Eagles would win the game. Also adding to the excitement was the fact that both the Cardinals and Eagles featured some of the game's biggest stars at the time. The Cardinals featured their superstar million-dollar backfield of Charlie Trippi, Elmer Angsman, Marshall Goldberg, and NFL scoring champion Pat Harder, who later became an NFL official and worked the Immaculate Reception game. The Cardinals also had all-pro lineman Buster Ramsey, who was later named to the NFL's 1940s All-Decade team, and all-pro receiver Mal Kuttner, who notched over 900 receiving yards in 1948. That's in a 12-game season, my friends. The Cardinals also included star quarterback Paul Christman, but he would miss the 1948 championship due to an injury. The Philadelphia Eagles had their own superstars. Steve Van Buren led the NFL in rushing yards and touchdowns for three straight years. In 1945, he scored 15 touchdowns in a 10-game season. Van Buren could be described as the Jim Brown or Earl Campbell of the 1940s a bruising runner with tremendous speed. Van Buren retired with the most rushing yards and the most touchdowns in NFL history. But the Eagles weren't just about the running game. Their quarterback, Tommy Thompson, was one of the league's most prolific passers. And in case you're thinking that the NFL never threw the ball before the Super Bowl era, I'll let you know that Thompson threw 25 touchdown passes in 1948. If Thompson threw those 25 touchdowns in 2019, he would have finished in the top 15 in the NFL. And remember, Thompson did that in 12 games as opposed to 16 games. 11 of those touchdowns were to future Hall of Famer Pete Pios. Seven were to Jack Ferrante. And both Pios and Ferrante were named to the NFL's 1940s All-Decade team. And speaking of the NFL's 1940s All-Decade team, four of the Eagles' starting linemen made that team. And this is in an era when guys often played both offense and defense. Sounds incredible, but I'm not making this up. Bucko Kilroy, Al Wister, Vic Sears, and center Alex Wojohowicz all made the 1940s NFL All-Decade team. And for you college football history fans, Wister has his number retired at Michigan, and Wojohowicz was one of Fordham's seven blocks of granite. Both teams also had head coaches with outstanding sports resumes who became early inductees of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Jimmy Consulman coached the Chicago Cardinals, and Greasy Neal was the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. And I'll post... More about both of them on the GameBeforeTheMoney.com as part of a series of posts to complement this podcast episode. So the 1948 NFL Championship game featured two Hall of Fame coaches and many well-known football players of the time. Several of those players had been big stars in college. And remember, this was a time when college football's popularity rated much higher than pro football. In college, a lot of the players played in front of crowds of 40, 50, 60,000 people or more. And in pro ball, they sometimes played to crowds under 20,000. But NFL Commissioner Burt Bell quickly spotted that new technology, television, as a way for his league to climb the ladder of success. Not only could television provide a reliable source of revenue, but it could also generate fans. Heading into the week of the 1948 NFL Championship game, Bell must have felt great about the matchup and the possibilities. Here was the team he founded, the Philadelphia Eagles, in a championship rematch against the defending champion Chicago Cardinals with an abundance of stars taking the field. And it was all going to be on television, 
where tens of thousands of current and potential fans could actually see the players. Although Charlie Trippy might have been a huge star and future Hall of Famer, you would have actually had to have been at the stadium to watch him play a full game. Burt Bell recognized that the time was coming when people could tune in and watch their favorite players score touchdowns on television. And he stood ready with the 1948 NFL Championship game. The game was scheduled to be played on December 19th, 1948 at Scheib Park in Philadelphia. And a lot of you who love baseball probably know that Scheib Park was also known as Connie Mack Stadium. Nowadays, the Super Bowl is played at a predetermined warm weather site or a dome stadium, but it wasn't like that before the Super Bowl era. The site rotated between divisions. The Western Division team hosted one year, the Eastern Division champion the next, and that meant that the championship game was often played in northern cities and in cold winter weather. The forecast for the day of the 1948 NFL championship game in Philadelphia called for cold and snow. We're in for a winter blast this weekend as temperatures fall to another 20 degrees. Our pressure system is coming in from the north, followed by a huge snow accumulation on Sunday. It's going to be a sloppy day out there. Meteorologists predicted blizzard-like conditions at game time NFL Commissioner Burt Bell could choose to postpone the game and wait for better weather, but that also meant postponing the television broadcast, the biggest NFL broadcast in history at the time. Like I alluded to earlier, Bell's decision would set the tone for the league for decades to come and declare that the NFL was as dependable as the U.S. mail in terms of delivering its product in a game that would be played in rain, sleet, and even a driving snowstorm. The weather forecast proved correct, and a blizzard hit Philadelphia on game day. The heavy tarp that covered the field had to be moved. Incredibly, it was the players that helped move it. Imagine today's players doubling as groundskeepers before the Super Bowl. That's what happened in the 1948 NFL championship game. The players didn't act alone, however. Commissioner Burt Bell took responsibility for his decision to play the game as scheduled. His son, Upton Bell, remembers. The morning we got up, it's a blizzard. And the day before, the Cardinal players had come in and voted not to play in the game. And my father told them, you don't play in the game, and that's it. This is the first match league televised and radio game. We're going to play this. And so we go to the game in a driving snowstorm. But there's a picture somewhere of Burt Bell in, in a suit and overcoat helping the ground crew push the tarp off the field to get the game going. So you had the NFL commissioner and the players clearing the field before the game to ensure the NFL met its first championship game television contract. Things didn't go exactly perfectly. A newspaper report the next day stated that the game did start 30 minutes late. That might have worked in the Eagles' advantage in a huge way. Philadelphia coach Greasy Neal looked around the Eagle locker room before game time and noticed that one of his players was missing. And it wasn't just any player. It was superstar Steve Van Buren. There's a story of Steve Van Buren the great running back, the precursor to Jimmy Brown, actually figuring the game was called off and was in bed till he got a call that said, where the hell are you? And he ended up taking a cab in the subway and getting to the game just in time for the game. And so the game went on. The nationwide audience sat comfortably at its chairs while the players and fans in the stadium braved the blizzard. Upton Bell watched the game with his father in the press box. And I sat up in the press box, and it, it, Connie Mack stated there was no elevator, nothing. You had, you had to climb up these scary stairs, and you get to the top in this little press box that overlooked the field. And it was, you know, it was a little blizzard. And to me, that's what life was. You survived the blizzard. 
Burt Bell worked to make sure the NFL championship game survived the blizzard. In a day when the NFL used five officials per game and had three alternates, he ordered that all eight be used to officiate this game. Enough snow fell on the field after the tarp was lifted that flags were placed on the sidelines to mark the yard lines. A New York Times account of the game by writer Arthur Daly stated that officials frantically shoveled snow before the game in search of the 50-yard line. Referee Ronald Gibbs declared that the officials wouldn't be measuring for first downs. Eagles player Ernie Steele once recounted that the snow was so thick that he couldn't even see the fans. Nearly 30,000 Hardy fans braved the elements, however, and witnessed the first building block of NFL Championship game broadcasts in person. This is a Basie Sports Network update. I'm Hal Rosenberg, live in Philadelphia, anticipating the kickoff of today's 1948 NFL Championship game. The main story so far is the weather. Teams will be playing in blizzard-like conditions as a winter snowstorm has struck Philadelphia. The Chicago Cardinals have won the coin toss and will receive the game's opening kickoff, which will be happening in minutes. We will keep you posted throughout the afternoon on the Basie Sports Network. The Eagles kicked off as the snow accumulated quickly. Estimates stated that at least four inches of snow accumulated during the game. On the first series, the Eagles defense stopped the Cardinals and took over at their own 35. You might think that this is the 1940s. The Eagles probably ran up the middle for three yards in a cloud of snow. But that wasn't the case. The Eagles did the exact opposite. On their first play from scrimmage, they called the bomb. Quarterback Tommy Thompson launched the ball to Jack Ferrante, who caught it, slipped in the snow, and got up and ran in for a score. In today's game, he probably would have been called down by contact, but that rule came in a few years later. Ferrante instead left two Cardinal defenders face down in the powder. But there was only one problem. The Eagles were offsides and the touchdown came back. Jack Ferrante returned to the huddle quite angry. He wanted to know who messed up his touchdown by being offsides. When I interviewed Eagle lineman Al Wistert for the book The Game Before the Money, he recounted the story about Jack Ferrante returning to the huddle afterwards. It was an offside on the play. The guy who came running back after the play was over and says, who the hell was offside? They said, you were Jack, Jack <laughs> Ferrante. <laughs> he was offside. The reason that it was so glaring that he was offside, nobody else went downfield at all for the blocks, you know. Everybody stayed out of the line of scrimmage because we knew that there was only going to be one guy going down for the pass. That was him. The Eagles stalled and the Cardinals picked things up on the ensuing possession and drove into Philadelphia territory. Pat Harder tried a 37-yard field goal attempt and missed, and the game remained scoreless, but the windy snowstorm continued. And so that's a good place to make another point about the importance of televising this game. The weather added a lot of visual interest to the game. People living in California or Florida had never seen snow like that in their entire lives. But now they experienced it live on television. The weather also added another variable to the championship. It wasn't just which team could beat the other, but who could survive the elements? Which team could survive the blizzard to beat their opponent? Let's take a second and think about how the combination of weather and television combined to create iconic NFL moments for millions of television viewers. The Ice Bowl, the 1970s Mud Bowl playoff between the Vikings and Rams, the Patriots-Dolphins snowplow game, 
the Cowboys Dolphins Thanksgiving game. These are moments that helped build the league and our games we still talk about today. So Burt Bell, even in 1948, recognized that television could help create iconic moments. And he also believed that the NFL's future would greatly increase through television. Early on, I remember hearing him say on the phone, he said, uh, the reason that this game is going to be big, even though we're behind college football and baseball right now, is basically because pro football is the most televisable of all games. Now, audiences could actually watch plays unfold. Which brings us to Philadelphia's offense. NFL offenses in the pre-Super Bowl era are often referred to as uncreative, three yards in a cloud of dust style offenses. That wasn't true with either of these two teams. And we'll first focus on Philadelphia's offense. Earlier, I talked about Steve Van Buren, often called the Jim Brown of his era. But the Eagles also featured quarterback Tommy Thompson. Nearly 40% of Thompson's career touchdown passes went for over 30 yards. He could float the ball long and accurately, as he did on the Eagles' first play from scrimmage in the 1948 NFL Championship game. The Eagles' offense also used quite a bit of misdirection. If you find highlights from this game, you might notice that a few of the plays look like precursors of the 1970s Dallas Cowboys. A lot of movement from the linemen and the backfield, and oftentimes in the opposite direction of where the ball was headed. Upton Bell points out how modern the Eagles offense was, albeit from earlier lineup formations. He also points out that the Eagles weren't the only team running an innovative offense. Remember, it was a full house backfield then. You had Van Buren, who was the right halfback. You had Joe Newhar, who was the fullback, and you had Bosch Pritchard, who what they called the scatback. They used a lot of misdirection, which you see today, but not in the full backfield. It looks like a modern offense if they had broken one person off. And I saw Clark Shaughnessy draw it on the blackboard in 1946, showing how is how you break one of the backs out and make them, at that time they called it a flanker. And so if Pritchard had been moved out to a flanker, and you had Muhal and Van Buren, you would have the modern offense. So the Chicago Bears under George Hallis also ran a more modern type offense than you might expect. In fact, the 1947 Bears averaged over six yards per play, a number that would have placed them tied for third in that category in the 2019 NFL season. The Chicago Cardinals featured the million-dollar backfield that included quarterback Paul Christman. The Cardinals not only featured spectacular running from players like Trippy and Angsman, who each had long runs for touchdowns in the 1947 NFL championship game, but they also threw enough that Christman earned the nickname Pitchin' Paul Christman. Charlie Trippi also passed quite a bit from the halfback position and eventually played quarterback in his later years. Trippi had two pass attempts in the 1948 championship game and he looked to throw a third but was forced to run. Statistically, the 1948 Cardinals had the league's leading offense and again, we're not talking about the three yards and cloud of dust football here. The Cardinals averaged 5.8 yards per play in 1948, and that's higher than six of the 2019 NFL playoff teams. The 1948 Eagles offense finished higher than four of those 2019 playoff teams. Both finished higher in yards per play than the Aaron Rodgers-led Packers offense that made the 2019 NFC Championship game, and both also averaged more than the Tom Brady-led 2019 New England Patriots. Now, once you learn that, it might not surprise you as much to find out that the Eagles threw on almost 40% of their plays in the second quarter, despite the driving snowstorm. The Cardinals 
pass rush proved to be a deterrent as much as the weather. And by halftime, neither team had scored despite opportunities. Halftime here in Philadelphia for the NFL championship game. The blizzard conditions continue, and we have a scoreless tie. Both offenses have moved to the ball, however. Running back Steve Van Buren is having a particularly good game for the Eagles, but has not been able to find the end zone. The Cardinals' pass rush has been a real weapon this afternoon. The Eagles drove inside the Chicago five-yard line, but Tommy Thompson's rushed throw was high and out of reach of receiver Pete Diaz. Chicago's defensive line forced another hurried throw from Thompson that ended up in an interception as he attempted to throw deep for Bosch Pritchard. The Eagles' defense also playing well. Philadelphia halted a cardinal drive in the second quarter with a 12-yard sack by Walt Barnes. Both teams had missed field goal attempts, and again, we remain scoreless at halftime in Philadelphia for the NFL championship game. Philadelphia will receive the second half kickoff. The Eagles received the second half kickoff, but fumbled near midfield early in the drive. Chicago recovered, and Cardinal backup quarterback Ray Malif threw on first down for 11 yards. The Cards faced a fourth down in inches from the Eagle 30, and they went for it, and the Eagle defense stopped the Cardinals. Van Buren gained five yards for the Eagles on the ensuing first down, and Philadelphia quarterback Tommy Thompson threw two straight incompletions. On third down, however, Cardinal tackle Big Joe Coomer was flagged for roughing the passer. Yes, you heard that right, roughing the passer. So even in the 1948 NFL championship game, there was a third down play that ended with the offense getting a first down on a roughing the passer penalty. The drive failed to net points, however, as the Eagles missed a 37-yard field goal attempt. The game remains scoreless late in the third quarter. And here's where I point out that football is football in pretty much any era. The 1948 NFL Championship came down to everything that close games come down to over 70 years later. Who makes the most plays and who makes the most mistakes? The Cardinals made a mistake on a botched snap. Philadelphia's Bucko Kilroy recovered the fumble inside the Chicago Cardinal 20. Bucko Kilroy recovered the fumble, but he didn't leave the field. Remember, this is in a day when a lot of guys played 60 minutes. So Kilroy recovered the fumble on defense and then lined up on the offensive line. The Eagles ran Bosch Pritchard on the first play from the Cardinal 20, and Kilroy lined up at right guard and pulled behind the center to the left side to seal off a linebacker. That opened up a lane for Pritchard and earned five yards. And that was the final play of the third quarter. Over the next two plays, the Eagles earned a first and goal inside the five. And they called on their superstar running back, Steve Van Buren. On two, down! Van Buren took the handoff and scored from five yards out. The box score simply states a five-yard Van Buren rush 
and notes the extra point. Lost in the box score is how the Eagles' great offensive line cleared the path and Van Buren's speed and strength got him over the goal line. The Philadelphia Eagles have just taken a 7-0 lead in an NFL championship game. Steve Van Buren carried the ball five yards through an enormous hole created by linemen Buckle Kilroy and Al Wister. Kilroy moved from his guard position over to the right to seal off the defensive end, and Wister knocked out two Cardinal defenders with one block, creating a hole that looked to be half the size of Pennsylvania. The score is now Philadelphia 7, Chicago 0, early in the fourth quarter. Now back to our Basie Sports Radio Network headquarters in New York and Duke Sanderson. Thank you, Al. A tremendous block there by Kilroy and Worcester. And when the ball is in the hands of someone like Steve Van Buren, the Cardinals just didn't have a chance on that play. The game wasn't over, however. There was still nearly a quarter left of football. The Philadelphia defense held Chicago to a three and out on the ensuing drive, but a 52-yard Cardinal punt backed the Eagles up to their own 14-yard line. Like in today's game, the Eagles hoped to chew up yardage and chew up clock at the same time. And just like in today's game, Eagle quarterback Tommy Thompson sent a man in motion before the snap. A running back ran from the right side of the backfield all the way past the left tackle. Thompson took the snap and ran a delayed quarterback draw, much like you'd see today. He faked the pitch to Van Buren and then turned around and ran up the middle for 17 yards. The Eagles drove into Cardinal territory with running plays. Philadelphia's offensive line dominated the line of scrimmage through a combination of stunting and physicality. At this point in the game, the Cardinals' line looked worn down. The drive ended with a 39-yard missed field goal attempt, but the Eagles ate time off the clock and shifted field position as the Cardinals started from their own 20 with about five minutes left after the missed field goal. Remember, a lot of players played both offense and defense during this era, especially on the line, and Philadelphia's defensive line broke through on second down, and four Eagles crushed new Cardinal quarterback Charlie Eichenberg for a 12-yard loss. The Eagles' defense made another big play as veteran defensive back Ernie Steele, playing in his final NFL game, leapt in the air to make a drive-ending interception. Steele later called it the biggest play of his seven-year career. Philadelphia then ran out the clock although the game ended with the Eagles at the Cardinal two-yard line. The Eagles had won the NFL championship game 7 to nothing. Fans carried Steve Van Buren off the field. The Eagles celebrated in the locker room. Commissioner Burt Bell told the Eagle locker room that they deserved the championship and nobody could have expected a better game under the conditions. His son Upton says that it was his father's custom to meet with the teams and officials after a game. The Cardinal locker room was obviously sullen. Charlie Trippy pointed out that the Eagles got the breaks in the game, especially on the late third quarter fumble. Cardinal assistant coach Phil Handler was a bit more defiant. He said the fumbled snap was indeed the difference in the game, but the Cardinals had won five of their last six against Philadelphia, and he vowed that the next time the two teams played, the Cardinals would make it six out of seven. Handler actually became the Cardinals head coach the next season, and his boasting proved a bit hasty. The Cardinals lost handily to the Eagles in 1949, and wouldn't return to an NFL championship game 
until Super Bowl 43, a full 60 years later. For the Eagles, the 1948 NFL Championship was their first of two straight titles. They shut out the LA Rams in the 1949 NFL Championship and remain the only team to win back-to-back championships with shutout victories. For the NFL, the game placed a stake in the ground and laid the foundation for the league's future. The NFL's first live nationally televised championship proved a great success. The NFL brought an exciting and memorable game to viewers and established a we're going to play this game no matter what precedent. Had Burt Bell decided to postpone the 1948 game due to weather? Would iconic games like the Ice Bowl or the Mud Bowl have been postponed? We can't say for sure, but we certainly know that Bell indeed felt the need to meet the television contract. He was also quoted as saying that he wanted the game to go on for fans who had traveled from Chicago and other faraway places in days before faster interstate drives and regular flights. The 1948 NFL Championship game also established the annual event of Americans watching the NFL title game. As more and more Americans bought television sets, soon to be in the homes of millions, more and more Americans watched pro football and became NFL fans. The fan base grew for the 1949 game, which was another memorable game for its weather, and then more and more fans kept tuning into the NFL championship game. And in 1953, the NFL championship game featured a breathtaking finish with a Bobby Lane led drive in the final minutes. Perfect television watching. And then you fast forward 10 years past the 1948 NFL championship game. The stage had been set for the 1958 NFL championship game and the greatest game ever played. The annual television broadcast of the NFL championship game was by 1958, an event that millions of people watched every year. So when NBC broadcasted that 1958 game, an enormous sized television audience was already built in thanks to 10 years of regular championship broadcasts. The 1958 NFL championship game firmly established the NFL in American sports lore but the tiny seeds for that were planted in the snowy ground during the 1948 NFL Championship Games television broadcast. Upton Bell talks about the NFL's television success in the 1950s under his father, Commissioner Burt Bell, during a time when Major League Baseball and college football owned much greater popularity than the NFL. You had, during the 50s, uh, in the middle 50s, the game of the week, brought to you by the Newmont Network, negotiated by Burt Bell. It was big. Saturday night, watching the NFL in prime time was big. Television also increased revenue, and this was vital to the NFL. Because at the time of the 1948 NFL Championship game, the league was less than 30 years old. Television money helped the teams, and it helped the players, The league reported the gross receipts for the 1947 championship game the year before was about $160,000. The televised 1948 game raked in over $228,000. The winner's share in 1947 was about $1,100. The televised 1948 game brought winning players over $1,500. That's a considerable difference in an era when the estimated average American family earned about $3,200 a year. The day after the 1948 NFL championship game, newspapers announced that the AAFC leaders wanted to meet with the NFL to discuss the future, and the NFL absorbed three AAFC teams for the 1950 season. The 1948 NFL Championship game might not be that well known of a game, but its impact on the history of the National Football League stands tall. Upton Bell remembers driving home with his father after the game. I think the thing about him was, of all the commissions, all the sports, 
he could look ahead 20, 30, 40 years and see things that none of us could see. But he never talked about them. You know, on the way home, he just talked about the game. He was glad it was over, glad Van Buren made it in time. He would talk, but you wouldn't always know what was in his mind. He didn't say, geez, this is it, or we made it through the game or anything like that. He just talked about the game like it. He talked like it. It wasn't a blizzard. He talked like we were there. It was 60 degrees. Watching that game and hearing my father talk and then, you know, it took us hours to get home afterwards. I kind of felt, now remember, I am 11, but I think I'm fairly grown up. I said, this game came off and this is the beginning. It was the beginning indeed. Ever since that day, the NFL's championship game and Super Bowls provided some of sports' most memorable games and individual performances, in no small part to live television and the resulting film. The broadcast made national heroes out of players like Johnny Unitas and Bart Starr. The broadcast showcased unforgettable runs by Marcus Allen and John Riggins, Legendary defensive plays by Chuck Bednarik, and Bob Lilly, and Willie Brown, and spectacular catches made by Lynn Swan and John Taylor. They molded the legacies of coaches like Noel, Lombardi, Landry, Walsh, Shula, and quarterbacks like Bradshaw, Montana, and Namath. In more recent times, Super Bowl Sunday reigns as an unofficial national holiday, with halftime and pregame galas tailor-made for television, lifting the game high above its competition as the most-watched sporting event in the United States. The timeline traces back to a snowy day in Philadelphia in 1948. to a game that Steve Van Buren, one of the NFL's biggest stars, gained more yardage than the entire opposition. On a day he figured the game would be postponed and almost didn't show up. Afterwards, in a Philadelphia snowfall thicker than the confetti on Super Bowl Sunday, Van Buren stepped through the quieted stadium's gates and onto the Philadelphia streets. He walked several blocks to the subway station, paid his fare, and took the trolley homeward. We don't know what his thoughts might have been on the ride home, but he likely sat completely unaware that one day, the game he just played in would grow into an event that the entire world would watch, hosted by a league that would reign as the king of American sports. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Game Before the Money podcast. Please subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on the rest of the episodes in this three-part series with Upton Bell and interviews with NFL and college football legends. A special thanks to Upton Bell for sharing his memories about being at these iconic games. And remember, you can get his book, Present at the Creation, filled with many wonderful stories. Transcriptions of the Game Before the Money podcast can be found at thegamebeforethemoney.com. Music and sound effects including fictional historical radio broadcasts, are produced by Eleven Productions. Transcriptions are powered by our transcription partner, Sonics. Visit sonics.ai to learn more about their transcription services. S-O-N-I-X sonics.ai